People are saying, hello, Esther, so excited to have you today. We hear you, Esther, hear you loud and clear. Okay, I think we're in good shape. I'll do this. Less aesthetic. <laughs> I just got a big hello from Norway. Voila. Okay, perfect. Great. So wonderful to have you. Are you in New York? New York. I city? am. I am in the city right now. Yes. You're back in the city. I know you've been wondering. Yeah, I'm back oh. in the city for a few days, and then I'll go back up. But I needed to come back. <laughs> Good. Good. Oh, well, we're delighted to have you. Um, you know, I first was introduced to you live at Lewis Howe's Summit of Greatness. This was mm -hmm. back in 2017, if you remember that, and um, was just so inspired by your words. You ended your talk in dating and relationships were often picked for a role that we didn't audition for, and I had just been ghosted in a really painful way, and that was the impetus for starting the group, and here we are. I never um, knew the beginnings of this group, okay? Because <laughs> yeah. I remember meeting you at sessions, yeah, in our yeah, training I, uh, conference, annual conference. So um, very nice. I didn't know that that was uh, yeah. the start, the Ghost, origin. <laughs> yeah, ghosting was the origins of the group. Um, okay, well, everyone here uh, looks like everyone can hear us well, and we're all across the world. Portugal, I saw Norway, Netherlands. Hi from your home country. Um, so, so beautiful comments and the sound is good. Um, so I, I wanted to start off with some questions just about the podcast. Yeah. What was it about this couple in particular and their story that inspired you to choose it from the multitude of submissions that you receive? So the first thing you need to know is I don't select the couples. It is my producer, Jesse Baker, who really chooses you know, we discuss what are stories we haven't told, you know, what would be an interesting other topic, things like that. But basically, she does the screening, she does the initial call, and, um, um, and but she did tell me about them. And she said, I have this couple, um, and what's very interesting is some of the particular issues that are re reversed, as in it's a gay couple, and typically you expect that more in a straight couple, and they have a very interesting story. And I said, of course. Uh, and they have a very good relationship. They do not really, you know, they don't really have many issues. And I like that too. Like, is that really so? Do, do we exist <laughs> without issues? Um, and so that's kind of how, how um, I trust her. And I also knew that it was a story we hadn't told. I love that. And that kind of goes to my next question, which is, I'm curious if there was a specific relationship topic or dynamic that you would love to shine a light on through the podcast that you haven't been able to yet because you haven't gotten a submission for it. For where should we begin? I have not tackled the subject of fertility and couples who struggle uh, with protracted fertility for years on end and what that does to a relationship. That's a, no, a subject that I haven't done much. Um, I haven't done much the subject of 23andMe and people who find their entire families and siblings, which are things that I've known from friends of mine um, and, and histories of them that they didn't know and all of that. For how is work, I am really, really eager to find stories and people with experiences of having been laid off, of losing their job, of, uh, of, of, I would like to have situations where the people can bring the person that they have the conflict with, which mm -hmm. doesn't always happen so easily. Um, everything that has to do with the work situation and how it is impacting our life at this moment. Yeah. That's great to know. Okay, so everyone who's tuning in, yeah, yeah, yeah. a couple yeah. hundred of you, get just those permissions in. And uh, the applications are on my website. Just go directly to the podcast page and uh, you have all the information you need. Perfect. Um, okay, let's dive into the episode. Let's go. Why did you pick that episode? I think you picked it. I picked it. <laughs> okay. Or your team, your team suggested that it would be a good one. Yeah. And um, I loved it. Um, I thought it was profound. And I saw three major themes that come up so much in the group, um, in this podcast. Separateness and togetherness. Yep. Uh, inner child responses to mm -hmm. things. And embodied feelings. 
Yes. So I want to start with a clip. And I'm going to play the clip and then I'll ask. I know you like to batch your questions. So I do your way. I follow you. No worries. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to roll the clip. While he lives with a sense of himself as a happy, upbeat, optimistic person, it doesn't take much to realize that right underneath the surface, lives a lifetime of abuse, of manipulations, of put-downs and violence. And so as he talks about his background, he squints with his eyes, and it takes one squint just to know that he just chased away an image. And so I go for the image. What did you just see? And then I feel that he's not just seeing things, but he's hearing things. Speak to me in Spanish, because that's the language that you heard it in. And even if I didn't speak Spanish, I would still ask him to speak in his mother tongue. So I had chills when I first heard that clip. And I just thought it was so profound that you knew to look for the embodied response and was curious, how common is it for people to respond to trauma in this way with unconscious bodily responses? And where and how did you learn to look for embodied communication? And what are some other common bodily responses? It's a beautiful question. So the body speaks. Or as my colleague Bessel van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score. He, it holds our history. It, but I see it as a language. I am multilingual and the body is one more of them. I have trained in bioenergetics. I have trained with Diana Fosha and Stan Tatkin, some um, which are major trauma um, leaders, uh, leaders in the trauma field. Um, and they really taught me also to watch and to listen to the, you know, the watch, the tweak here, the, the apple, um, yeah. the, 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 the little thing that just, you know, it's a tiny flicker of a thing that just said, you know, I don't want to see. Um, the polyvagal nerve, the, the, all these very minor unconscious, deeply embedded uh, in the body move, movements that signal. You don't know what they signal, but um, the easiest one is this. I always taught my students, just watch the throat when a person speaks. Don't just look at them. Look at their face, look at the jaw, look at the eyes, look at the throat. You will see the emotion that is trying to be buried or the emotion that is trying to come out, whichever way you want to put, position this. So I then said to him, what did you just see? You just saw something, didn't you? And then he starts to describe this, you know, meanwhile, he's laughing the whole time, right? He's laughing while telling you horror stories so yeah. at that juxtaposition. Yeah. When he talks about seeing his father choke his mother and him begging with his little brother whose hand he's holding, puppy, puppy, stop. And at that moment, I, I don't even know how old he was. I don't think I even asked him how old he was. I just said, say it to me in Spanish. You know, yeah. Actually, the Spanish is about his homosexuality. But I knew at that moment so many things that have been supposedly left in the Dominican Republic just traveled with him in his suitcases, in his emotional suitcases, unbeknownst to him. Yeah. Overweight. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to take that with me for sure. Um, OK, so moving on to inner child responses. In the episode, you say, how is it that as children, we want the love of our parents, even when they didn't know how to love us properly? Why do we feel such a sense of duty and obligation to people who may have been cruel to us from whom we still want love? And so there was a group member question on that. She said, painful childhoods have a way of affecting every single area of our lives, sometimes without us realizing it and despite our ongoing work. What is necessary in order to not have this show up unexpectedly and constantly Sometimes it feels like we're perpetually broken and it's so tiring despite all the inner work that we're doing. So I would start by saying it's not because we have brokenness inside of us that we are broken. 
Um, he has vulnerability and brokenness inside of him. He has pain, but he has a whole life as well. And um, I think that it is a question. There are two things. One is how do we speak to the inner child and how does the inner child speak to us? And then the other one is how is it that children who grew up with sometimes very cruel parents are so caring, loving, and loyal to those very parents? And this is one of the questions that I have no real answer for. I mean, everything I've read has never been fully satisfying. The deep need for attachment, that we are willing to blame ourselves, that we will do anything not to sever the connection. But honestly, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. There are amazing parents with children who went totally off the track, and then there are cruel parents, absent parents, neglectful parents, abusive parents, who have the most loving children. And I leave this to one of those unresolved mysteries for me. I, I have never found really an answer. Now, what happens when the child speaks to you, that little person that sits right there, is really to develop a conversation. You know, it's like whatever the diminutive of his name, whatever name he would like to give to it. I love naming things. Yeah. I find that when you name something, it helps you externalize it. The way that Michael White, one of my teachers, used to talk about it. You externalize the problem so that you are not the problem. You are not broken. There are parts of you that are fearful, that are vigilant, rightly so, understandably so, and for good reasons. Now, that doesn't mean they have to remain hyperactive you know, when their situation no longer asks for it and they need to be told, you know what, there's no danger here right now. It's safe to connect. It's safe to laugh. It's safe to party. It's safe to not be, you know, on guard like that. And so we're going to name this little person here. And on occasion, you may need to say, we're okay. We are okay. D don't worry about it. I, I, I'm watching. I'm taking care of us. And you have this dialogue with the parts of you that need an adult to reassure them, that adult that never existed, but that you are now. Yeah, um, that's such a great segue. There was a moment when they were, t they were kind of arguing about the coffee versus the big event. And hold on, I have to find my question. Saturday morning or Saturday night. Yeah. Yes. And that was kind of that same moment where you said, like, sometimes you think you're talking to an adult, but really you're talking to their inner child. And so I was curious, like, what are some good suggestions for, let's say you notice that your partner has gone into their inner child. If you want to be like an ally in their healing and support them, what are some ways that you can do that? Like phrases or techniques? Look, I really, let's not talk about if it's coffee or alcohol, because that I don't think is what this is about. I'm not going to engage with you in a conversation if I should go out Saturday morning and I, because then I'll be, I'll be back at two versus I'll go out at night. Now, by the way, as the session evolves, you start to really understand what is the thing he really worries about. So that's your first question is, what are you really scared about? What he's scared about is not the drinking. It's not even the I'm going to get I'm going to get drunk. It's the fact that I'm going to connect emotionally to someone and that you're going to have to share me and that you're going to have less of me. And that takes three, four more rounds till we get there. So the first thing is don't jump to an answer. Don't try to instantly reassure when you actually are not really sure what it is that you're answering. Then the next thing is, you know, yeah. you ask, what is it that really worries you about this? What, what, what all the way through to the end, to the end, to the end of the night, what's the thing that's going to keep you awake so that I understand what you want from me and what I'm supposed to reassure? And the thing is that you think that if I don't go out, that is what I will be reassured, you know, then you will be reassured. If there's no threat, then there is no worry, you know, but I don't want my behavior to be a threat to you. So, what can I do? so that I can have my sense of freedom and my autonomy and I can have a social life that does not only involve you or always involve you. And B, you know, how do we, it, it is a negotiation in which I hear what you want from me. Some of it I can do, some of it I may not be the one responsible to do. So it becomes, how can you talk, you know, to your little guy here to reassure him so that he knows I'm coming back, I'm not, you know, most of the time when people leave while holding someone's hand, they only want to come back to the hand that has held them and let them, 
wander in the world. I mean, why why leave that place? Where the place where you have security and freedom at the same time is a very, very enchanted place. So it's both ends. What can I do? To what degree can I do things without it being that I'm responsible for this? It's not entirely my role to reassure you about this because a part of you needs to reassure yourself. If I do all these things while you continue to say, why shall I trust you? Then we won't reach anywhere. So it's this constant small, small step, small step like this. And then we check it. I come back, we discuss it again. How was it? I think that's a very good one, is that you don't you, you actually use the event, or whatever the thing is that you're negotiating or trying to reassure, and you say, how was this one for you? What needs to be tweaked here? How did it get better? What did you fret the whole night? You know, and you do a, a slight monitoring. I don't think partners are each other's therapists. I think that we can be helpful in the worries of the other a great deal. But that doesn't mean that we are responsible for it, neither for creating it necessarily or totally, and not for fixing it totally. Yeah. It's so funny, Esther, because I feel like in every podcast, there's a nugget that's so relevant to my life, no matter what the story is or that's where I hope. <laughs> And so I'm really dealing with this right now personally, where I've just embarked on being the third in a polyamorous relationship. Mm -hmm. And when this couple met, they were polyamorous, but they haven't been for a while and they've been together for a while. And I think now that they're established and talking about like starting a family and having kids together, I think the woman in the relationship thought like, oh, the whole polyamory thing will kind of fade away once we're like settling down. And we just kind of happen to all collide now. And you had the line, they're sharing that makes you feel like you have more and they're sharing that makes you feel like you have less. And so uh, I think the guy is feeling like the sharing is giving him more and the woman is feeling like the sharing is giving her a lot less. So I was curious, what are your tips for navigating it when one partner feels like they're getting less and the other partner feels like they're getting more? I think it's a real challenge. I mean, um, and over time can become really uh, a deal breaker. I mean, there's no doubt. It's like it either becomes an enriching experience for all, but if one person is experiencing the suffering of it, if you want, um and it it's an issue so the first thing i think is you talk to her it's actually an alliance between you and her mm -hmm. um so that she feels that you really have a relationship with both of them and not just with him that's one thing because the first thing is you know he gets to have two women you know and she gets to lose a part of her partner to another person who completes, who compensates, whatever it is. That's a big distinction, whatever is completion and whatever is compensation. So that's another piece here. You want to ask her, what's her concern? You know, is this something that she has reluctantly agreed to as a way of basically not losing him? That's a bad deal for, for you too. It's not a good arrangement. It's like, you know, it, you, it's either a, an existential choice that people really embark on together because they find it an enriching experience and they want to experience connection and couple them that isn't just in the singular. But if it really is done as a subjugation, as a, I, I agree to it because, because whatever, he always told me or the, the other one, whoever the day is, to, you know, and it was part of the arrangement from the start, but but it no longer sits well with me, or it sitted well with me, but not with this particular person, then you have a trouble triangle. Yeah. And uh, if you just entered, I think that it's a good idea for you to not have him speak for her, to really show her that you are deeply interested in what her experience is and how it could become if she's interested. You know, does she have an interest in it becoming a good experience or does she have an interest in it kind of ending? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Because if she wants it to end, then he will be caught and then he will be triangulated. 
And then the whole thing defeats the purpose. I mean, it's doable. People do every, all kinds of things, but it defeats the purpose of the richness of a polyamorous situation rather than a trouble triangle. Yeah. Um, there was um, there was an element of this story that you said led your producer, Jesse, to select it. And it really piqued my attention when I heard it. Um, and it was the line that said, sex and playing with a third wasn't threatening for one partner. It was the closeness and the intimacy, which is often reversed for straight people. And I'm so curious why that is, the difference between gay and straight relational threats. This couple plays together. And that's a consensual adultery. That's We enjoy being sexual with other partners together, with each other. So it comes with a sexual freedom, a sexual liberation, and a certain kind of sexual politics that they have as gay men. So there is no threat there for them. But they have been intensely allied and they have been really a harbor for each other. And in that sense, they really, in some way, saved each other. And so if you go out, and he says it very clearly, he says, it's not like I'm making out with them. It's the fact that I'm connecting with them. And that's where the other person says, I don't mind sharing you physically, sexually but I do mind sharing you emotionally. I think in the reverse, in the straight world, and it varies in the straight world among genders too. I mean, the interesting thing when you work with gay couples, lesbian couples, is that you get to see relational dynamics that are not necessarily gendered. You see the roles that often in a straight version are played out in a gendered fashion, whereas in fact, they are much more often about roles than the gender, but in particular context, they become gender. I hope I said that clearly. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, what happens um, in, in the straight world, the politics are very different. The politics of monogamy have been inculcated, you know, throughout history. So that, you know, the question even exists, is there such a thing as a sexuality that is an emotional? Or is there something that is emotional that is not a betrayal as if it was sexual? So you have a different set of questions. I'm talking on the broad spectrum. Every couple has its own conversation about this. You know, why is it that what hurts me in the traditional research, if the man has sex, it threatens the woman. But if the woman falls in, sorry, if the man has sex, it, it is not a threat to the woman. It's the love that is the threat versus for the man, it is her sexual freedom that is the truth. Right. That's the, the old story, the way that yes. it's always been told. You know, the answer to this has to do with what are the social meanings that have been given for women when they are sexual and for men when they are emotional and fall in love. You know, if he just sleeps around, this is all with quotes around here. You know, the story is, he didn't get attached, he will come home. That was in the only, you know, wherever he went to eat, he came home to that night. The marriage was preserved, and that was the goal of marriage. Is to, you know, whereas if she experienced her sexual freedom, the biggest threat, first of all, until not too long ago, was, and who will this baby be from? I mean, the consequences of a woman who experienced her sexuality freely was that you, don't, you didn't know for sure who was the father. You know, contraception is not very old. So it's all of those scientific, cultural, and religious underpinnings yeah. that dictate what are considered threats around sexuality and intimacy in couples. So fascinating. Um, thanks for expounding on that. That was helpful. Um, OK, I want to play our final clip, and it's about caregivers. <laughs> When we begin to re-experience with our partners things which we experienced with our first partners, which is our parents or our caregivers, it doesn't just come from nowhere. We pick a person who does just enough to ignite inside of us the memory, the cellular, visceral memory of those interactions so that we then start to respond to them from that place. You want to have a conversation about respect, 
he has a conversation about power. So now we need yes. to change the conversation. And that starts probably with you talking about what gets evoked for each of you. I love that. Okay, so the question that follows is, given this clip, what are your thoughts on what creates attraction? And how is it that we somehow sense that someone could ignite a memory of our early childhood interactions? All right, answer number one, we don't know it. It's, that's, the, that's the power of the unconscious. We don't know that they're going to ignite that. And that's not what we seek. You see, this is a, to me, this couple is a fantastic couple because they highlight so many things in, in incredible ways, including complementarity. They both grow up with rather similar situation, right? They both grew up with major chaos. They are the parents of their parents. In one situation, it's the father who is massively violent. In the other situation, it's the mother who is kind of presented as irresponsible, as you know, doing one job after another. In both cases, the boys support the parents financially from very early on. They're in their 20s as we speak. So you can imagine how early they started. But one of them, in response to the chaos, decided to be he didn't decide it, you know, but became more constrained, decided to, to that if he holds forth and if he checks and if he's more vigilant and he watches carefully for danger, he can somehow create a more stable, safe environment. And the other one is actually doing the same, but not from a place of, of control, but from a place of I'm very responsible, I work hard, I live my life, and on occasion, I just want to get drunk and party and yeah. let loose because I do it, you know. And this one ends up talking to his mother, you know, as if, and this one ends up talking to his father. You're not going to tell me what to do. And you, I can't trust you because you're an irresponsible woman, right? Who, you know, when you go out, you don't know where you end up. And uh, therefore, I have to watch on you. And so, f without, you know, thinking about it, in a split second, you've got a cast of characters. And we go exactly to your sentence. Audition for a play, you you know, re recruited for a play you didn't audition for. Yeah. Like, who are these people? You know, who are you speaking to? It looks like you're talking to your boyfriend, but in fact, you're not. You are and you're not. Because the boyfriend is acting just enough irresponsibly that you can then click into the old trigger and go with that. But initially, when I say to him, you like the fact that he could play. Because when you met him, yeah. his playfulness, his curiosity, his adventuresomeness is kind of what brought you to the U.S. in the first place. It, you followed him because, but that was attractive to you. But then when he plays and it's not with you, or when he does it and it's beyond your threshold, then you turn and what was initially attractive now becomes a source of conflict. It was called playful, now it's called irresponsible. That's the switch that happens in many couples. It was called reliable. Now it's called rigid and controlling. Yeah. And you have this line because you're so poetic. So I like to do like the most poetic version. You say, many of us are drawn to partners whose proclivities match our vulnerabilities. Right. The attraction stems from the fantasy that they can bring us the parts of ourselves that we want more of. And yet often the very thing that we choose them for will be what leads to conflict and ends the relationship. Right. So I'm curious, what are your suggestions for avoiding relationship endings due to proclivities matching vulnerabilities? So the ending or the, tr the struggle occurs because what originally is, is complementary. I like your free spirit. I'm drawn to it because I would like to be able to, on occasion, also let go, feel more free, be more playful. That's his draw. And the other one, you know, I have had an irresponsible mom that I had to watch out for the whole time. And I find this guy who is really stable, reliable, serious. I can lean on him. You know, I'm drawn to it. I want that stability, that rock. That's complementarity. 
he's going to help me. You know, each one is going to give me the piece of me that I would like a little more of. But often, I'm going to leave it with you. I want a little bit more off, but I don't want to have it. I don't want to have to do it. You yeah. know, the struggle is the polarization. When it flips, and now I fight about it, it's because I have taken it to the extreme. I don't, you know, I tell all the people who go to the extreme and basically tell me, you know, look, you want to control me. You're watching me with the clock until I come home. And the other one says, you think I'm just some drunk who doesn't know when to stop? Like, and everybody is talking from the caricature. And I think what's important is to just go back and say, tell me, why did you choose him? And the interesting thing is the answer that you're going to get is that the choosing him and the things that drew you to him are exactly the things that you currently are criticizing. Yeah. Once you start to connect that and you remember, this is actually the stuff I once liked. Now the question is, has it really, really changed? Or is your reaction to it what has really changed? It's a combination of things. You know, you rarely hear me say it's this or that. Right. But it helps you think, no, no, no. This is not just, you know, because I don't like it anymore. Or it was maybe attractive in my early 20s, but in my 40s, I really can't, you know, I don't, I don't want it anymore. I've, I've moved on. This used to be charming for me back then. I love to sleep on a couch in a, in a tiny little apartment, you know, on a, and, and <laughs> on a waterbed. And I'm done with this, you know. So there is that too. But generally what you want is to explain to people that very thing that you're arguing with is the thing that you once were drawn to. Yeah. And you're arguing with it because it threatens you. And you keep wanting the other person to change so that you don't have to feel bad. Yeah. But maybe you need to also look inside and realize what is it that's happening to you that is now making the impact and the meaning of what this person is doing to you the opposite of what it used to be. So powerful. Thank you. I love that. And we'll, we'll definitely take that to heart. I have two more questions. Hopefully we can fit them in. Perfect. I'll try to be short in the answers. Okay. So the first one, this was probably the most profound moment of the episode for me. You said, when you talk to him like that, I hear you talk to your father. And I was curious, how common is it that we do this in our adult romantic relationships? And what tips do you have for how we can gain awareness of how or when we do it with our partners to break the cycle? So I like you to go and get T-shirts. I used to, you know, I live near Canal Street, used to be near Canal Street. And I, I, uh, I always thought they had all these places that printed T-shirts. Yeah. So one had your name and had, one had the name of the parent that you think the other person is transferring on you. <laughs> and so when they would start talking and you think like, this isn't me, you could go put on your T-shirt, you know, and, uh, and have the name of the parent that you think you're, you're being, okay. So the yeah, point is humor. <laughs> Humor, humor is really one of my go-tos. I mean, we all do it. Yeah. We all do it. So it's not how common is it. It is, people can tell me, I don't have this with anybody else. And I say, I completely believe you. Because the only two relationships that are resonant with each other are the ones with your romantic partners and the ones with the people who raised you. Yeah. That's it. The others you can, you don't, no one, no one else will take you to that extreme. Yeah. So, you know, it's okay to say, you know, I think I've just been put in a character here, but this is not me. I mean, this may have been what you experienced at home, but I don't think that that's what's happening here. Therapy is a lot about highlighting these crossovers. Yeah. Where suddenly people, you realize they're not in the here and now with the person they're with. They're somewhere else. They're talking to somebody else. And there's a whole story that's being reactivated. What do you do with the awareness? You do two things. You talk to your partner, you talk to yourself. You talk to your partner, you talk, it goes back and forth. And you try to minimize the echo chamber that often will, you know, either distort or amplify or, or bring you to a place that isn't really what's happening. Yeah. So, you know, when he's talking, he says, you know, I said, he's maybe talking to your father, but you, you're talking to the mother. It's like, because... He's saying, you know, you're being so careless and so irresponsible. And this guy is not. Yeah. This guy is not. You yeah. need to see it. But sometimes you need a third person to see it. And that's yeah. where therapy will often take us out of those labyrinths where we get ensnared into yeah. all these old patterns that 
sing a song as if it's happening in the moment when it is happening in the moment because the body is happening is feeling it but it is not part of the full spectrum of the moment yeah so true um okay final question you shared so often we accept the other's comfort threshold as our own to keep the connection this is kind of like what we were talking about with the polyamory right. before. Um, and that threshold becomes the price of admission. What are your tips for respecting our partner's comfort threshold while also honoring our own? This is the biggest task of relationships. I mean, how do you hold on to yourself and how do you hold on to your partner at the same time? And periods where you hold on more to you and periods, I think these things are not static. And I really think that resilient couples are the ones who are able to revisit this throughout. There's a time when you are more vulnerable because you're pregnant, because you've just been laid off, because your father just died, where I need to not do certain things because I need to be careful because you're not in, you know, you're more vulnerable and therefore your threshold is going to sometimes limit me. I may have gone on a trip for three weeks, which usually may be nothing between us, but at this moment you're telling me, you don't even tell me don't go because you know that that's not a thing you can tell me because I don't take that very well. But I need to understand this is maybe a time when I don't travel or I travel for just a few days because your threshold dictates. I think the difference is, one is a question of attunement. I'm aware of you. I see where you're at. And my decisions have an effect on you. So I take them into account versus I have never done this because she or he doesn't like it. I've never, you know, whatever, gone to do extreme sports or taken a trip or, or changed my job because I wanted a different career or, or done things that were very significant to me just because you don't like it or i don't see my friends anymore because you don't like it or i don't visit my family more than once a year because you don't get along with them or it's that and then it becomes a power structure yeah. you know you're afraid and therefore i can't do things or you don't like certain people and therefore i can't do things and now i'm dictated by that and i don't do it to preserve the peace I don't do it because it's not really worth it. I don't do it because I avoid conflict. That is actually the biggest one. Yeah. You know, um, and then one day I get up and I just walk out and yeah. you don't know where this is coming from. Yeah. That's, that's one of the, the, the ways that this sometimes gets played out. It's like, you know, people will do it and hold it and hold it. And then one day something, something, a promotion or a layoff or, you know, a, a, a big a big existential shift that suddenly says is this it is this all there is to life yeah. am i going to do this for another something amount of years and then people end up reacting big time so i think the big difference is between a real relational attunement to how people modulate their behavior in response to another and juggle self and other all the time in this very rich and complicated way versus an imposition on one, one person's security sapping another person's freedom. Yeah, yeah, it's the, the dance between the two. The dance is the normal dance. That is the dance of relationships. Yeah. Well, Esther, we have to end on a note of gratitude. What are all these people telling you here? The whole dance? We're just all roll on the side. There's so much chatter. Um, so there's a woman in the group. I've actually become really close to her during quarantine because we've started a weekly women's Zoom call. Beautiful. And she's actually in the UK and she messaged me and said, is Esther aware how much we follow and adore her work? How much her words are sheer poetry? How impressive it, how impressive it is that she cuts through the BS so quickly and is able to understand what the issues are for each couple providing unique support for each without relying on a formula. How deep and meaningful her insights are, how much her work helps all of us so much, and how warm and funny she is. Thank and I'm very warm it. Whoever you are, thank you so much. No, I didn't. I didn't know this group existed for quite a few, I think a few years actually, a year or two. Yeah. Um, so no, it's very moving. Um, I also like that you argue with me that you don't just take what I say, that you discuss it, 
that you counter it. And I think that I'm putting out ideas and you enrich them. And that's how it should be. I'm not a truth teller. Thank you, Esther, so much for your time and for everything you do. Right. You too. Keep going, people. <laughs> Bye. Bye.